<laughs> hey, Andrew. Hey, Pete. How, you doing? How are you doing? Good, good. That is some wild headgear that you have on. Well, I figured since you teased me so much about the uh, teased me so much about my miner's headlamp that uh, you know be worth showing off a little bit. This is this is my can you see my aura look? You kind of see the kind of if you want to do the new age thing. Um, there's also uh, the sort of the the fade in fade out, and then. Uh, if I really want to get crazy and you know go to a rave, or maybe I want to pretend like I'm a a, a police officer and pull somebody over, you know. Yeah, that's. <laughs> or maybe you know pretend yeah. I'm a minion. So you seriously, the you wear this to bed to read? Well, not with this setting. See, if, if I want to, if I want to read, I can just. Uh oh. Are you there? Are you? Yeah, I'm not seeing my my video. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, but for some reason your video stopped. I probably just destroyed my camera with the uh, blinky lights. Maybe, because Skype is showing you frozen. Uh, if you want, wow. we can hang up and call you again. Uh, yeah, let's try that. I think you've psyched out your camera. Well, we actually have some thunderstorms rolling through the area, so maybe yeah, same here. causing right. a blip, so hold on. And now everybody can read the little chat. Here we go. There you go, in wonderful pixel vision. Lovely. Oh, but it's coming through. Good, it's clearing up. Yeah, and, so uh, we have those thund same thunderstorms here, and it's making a heck of a racket outside. I'm just amazed yeah. I still have power. Okay, so this is the setting that I use, or, or this, if I'm reading. All right, just four white LEDs and two brightness levels. Pretty simple. But as I mentioned before, um, I actually came up with something that's a little bit superior for uh, for reading purposes, especially since um, I'm getting a little older now. So that one left a pretty good wound on your forehead. That oh my, you look like Sailor Moon. So so this actually Sailor Moon. <laughs> it's like it's 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 got uh, this weird lens flare that's going down, and it looks like do you, those. Do you, anime do, you do you got it? Do you? Do you got to get in tune with Sailor Moon? Because that cartoon has got the boom anime babes that make you think the wrong thing. Yeah. Just okay. saying. I haven't seen Sailor Moon in like 15 years, <laughs> so I don't know. You, you don't know the song reference? No, I don't. You don't listen to Bare Naked Ladies? You know, I, I generally just listen to SoundCloud these days, so uh -huh. not a whole lot of uh, stuff, even everything that's like 15 years old. All right. So this was the gadget that I couldn't resist at the drugstore. I saw this. This is actually a pair of uh, reading glasses that have integral LEDs with switches. You can see the kind of the temple piece is a little on the thick side because it's got the battery and the wiring and all that. It's it's let, let's just say it's kind of like poor man Google Glass, I guess. I was just saying we've, without, we found something less the, socially uh, acceptable than Google Glass. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I get to be dorky at about a tenth of the price. Well, actually, and everybody will like think that that's what you have. Price. Like you'll go into a bar or something, and they'll make you take those off. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Could you take those off? No, I'm recording here. Come on. Yeah. Oh, what's the matter with you? So yeah. there's there's my door. There's my dorky stuff for the show. All right. All right. Jeff, so I'm going to stop being a dork. Oh, right, so never mind about the echo. I hope there's no echo. Let me know. Oh no, please, no more echo. Oh, <laughs> poor Val and I blind I blinded him. Oh. All right. So mouse pointer. There we go. Sorry about mouse that. Mouse pointer. I was picking Did your you? nose with a mouse pointer on that thing. Somebody pointed it out. Nice. Could you stop that, please? Yeah. All right. Uh, and so. Valentin said that he's blinded, <laughs> and I'm yes. guessing it's from the, the lens that's flare. Probably, that's probably me. All right. So before we jump into the actual technical content beyond my geeky headwear, um, in, in, the, in the same vein as our toy of the week last week, can we call it that, the toy of the week? Yeah. As long as nobody reads too much into that, I think we're good. <laughs> All right, so the toy of the week this week is the Nerf Jolt. Very it's the nice. smallest Nerf gun I have ever seen. This is not actually mine. This belongs to my six-year-old who bought it with his own money. So uh, this has a little lever down here, and you pull it down, and that arms it. And then you can, let's see if I can take the Don't camera out the camera. again. Don't shoot the camera. Uh, I missed, and I only have one shot with this. 
So yeah. this is this is sort of I guess you would call it the concealed carry of Nerf weapons because <laughs> you know you could put it just about anywhere. Um, let's keep it clean, folks. So uh, keep your binds out of the gutter. Um, that and did not I cross my it was, mind, but now it has. It was, Thank you very much. <laughs> it was probably less than five bucks. So uh, and I realize I'm holding it up without the Jolt lettering there. There, there it says Jolt. Or in the case of my uh, camera, it looks to me like it says to lodge. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've got this one, which is not uh-huh. the same as as what you have, but it's uh-huh. uh, it has a more satisfying cocking motion. It's like, right, and I'm I'm pretty pleased with that one. There's there's just something about that way. sound of the uh, of the the slide being racked, right? Even on a Nerf weapon, uh, yes. it's it's it it's again. sad, let's, but will uh, amuse us. Let's see if people can hear it. Yeah, yeah I think that, you can hear it pretty satisfying. Quickly. Very cool. So uh, I think we have. Yeah, just, oh, anyway. I think we also have an announcement to make. I think we, it's probably pretty obvious from the frame in the video right now that we have. What do we have? Oh yes, uh, so an actual show. I thought I was thinking, did you I was, and I get married or something? How drunk was I? What's going? Um, this no, yes. So we have a show name. Show. The show. Uh, we decided to call it the uninitialized show because that's clever. Um, but we're sticking the the idea of uh, uninitialized pointer and all the wonderful overrun stuff and things that go along with that. So you may have caught uh, some of the you know the the standby graphics and other stuff have just a bunch of random characters with some uh, some Easter eggs thrown in. Um, it looked and just a lot carried like that theme like, throughout. It looked to me a lot like a, a C sixty four barfed or something. Yeah, so I did actually use the <laughs> Commodore font, the okay, narrow good. like eighty column version. Of course. So it wasn't just my imagination. No, no, no. Uh, so that's pretty good there. And in case anybody notices that I'm talking like William Shatner a bunch here, it's because I hear myself in my ear like a second after I talk, and Wirecast doesn't seem to have a solution for that in this version. But if I read just before the show correctly, if I only shell out another three or four hundred dollars, I can get their pro version, which doesn't have the echo in my head. Anyway, I don't know. I, I think the see. William Shatner version sounds kind of cool. I'm you, Klingon bastard. Yes. You yes. killed my son. Yes, completely bizarre. So, exactly. Hey, so today's topic is Kickstarter. Yeah. A- and awesome. kind of um, crowdfunding stuff in general. Um, yeah. Both things that we've found that are really interesting, things that we've mm-hmm. got, um, things that are um, uh, you know currently out there looking for funding, but with the bent that you and I would put on it. So the really kind of interesting geek things that we found out there. <laughs> and uh, so you you bought a lot. Of, uh, I guess bought isn't the right word. So maybe we'll even start there. How about backed? Uh, you've backed a lot of Kickstarter projects. Yeah, right. a, fair, a fair a fair number. number. So let, let's talk about the concept of backing, right? Because uh, the whole idea of crowdfunding is to take the power uh, or the I guess the kind of distributed distributed nature of the internet and essentially allow any person to become kind of a minor investor, if you will, in a project. Not necessarily investor as in some kind of guaranteed reward, or you get stock, or you get something else. But the idea that somebody has a great idea, and instead of going to a bunch of you know angel investors or VC funds or whatever else and saying, "Hey, give me five hundred thousand dollars to you know to bring this project to fruition," and having to sell you know these institutional type folks on their vision, right. what they can do is go to somebody like. Uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, or there's a whole bunch of them cropping up. Um, Kickstarter, I guess, is probably the best known of them. And put their project out there and say, here's our vision. Here's what we're doing. Here's where we are in the process. We need this much money to get to the next step in the process. And what they what they will also do in the process is offer certain rewards to People for you know for providing that funding. Now those things aren't necessarily guaranteed. It's not a store, and if the project's not funded, you know you don't spend anything and you don't get anything. Um, but the idea is okay. Let's say you know the probably the most famous kick, Kickstarter of all is like the Pe- the Pebble Watch. Right. right. They made an unbelievable amount of. It was like twelve million or something like that, wasn't it? 
Uh, I don't remember what the total was, but it was the fastest to be funded. It was one of the the highest funding ever on Kickstarter. Um, you know, it was really just a lot of people obviously liked their vision. You know, liked the look of what they were, uh, you know, what they were trying to bring to market. But one of the other things that that Pebble was kind of a good example of is that projects that that are that are crowdfunded can sometimes run into issues, right? right. So they their schedule could slip, or you know, that things things happen when you're doing, especially when you're doing something where you're manufacturing electronics, especially small electronics, um, you know, and so. The- there's such a thing as being too popular because yeah. the if if you for example have a target funding of say fifty thousand dollars right mm-hmm. and that means x number of units and then if you don't cap that and you end up at say twelve million dollars the, <laughs> the the approach that you would take to manufacturing for that you know say a thousand units versus ten thousand units is probably quite different Right. Yeah, there's a lot more hump, hoops to jump through. I mean, just imagine, you know, if you the difference between a thousand units and a hundred thousand units, just in terms of supply chain, right? Yeah. If you've researched and figured out where can I get all the parts to manufacture, you know, a thousand of these widgets, and you've got that all lined up, and then suddenly you find yourself in the position of I've got to manufacture a whole mess more of these, yeah. um, you know, that can be tricky. But the but the I think the game changer for crowdfunding is really the ability to leverage small amounts of money from lots and lots and lots of people, right? Because a lot of these Kickstarters, um, you'll even see that they'll have dollar level pledges or $10 level pledges where you may not actually get a reward that involves the product that's being manufactured or created. You may just get a thank you or you may get, might get a name on a web page or you might get a t-shirt you know, yep. there's there's levels for everybody who wants to participate. So it might be that you know you're not you're not flush this week. You don't feel like you can you know pledge a hundred bucks to back something, but you could pledge ten bucks and help somebody bring their vision to life. And that's right. just really cool. Yeah, and it's all sorts of stuff. Like the 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 funding here on Kickstarter and Indiegogo and Pledge Music and a bunch of different other places. It's not just technology with a product at the end um there's some are you know funding artists to create movies uh, mm-hmm. funding yep. people for installations um funding uh you know for example in pledge music you're usually funding an album and getting some sort of music stuff uh, in return um of course lots of devices uh on indiegogo once i saw somebody surprisingly successfully run a campaign so that they could get something for themselves they get they got enough people to back them to buy like this thousand dollar thing for themselves, and it was just like thank you handwritten thank you notes were the rewards. Now I don't know that that's yep. going to work very often, but it's still it's it's quite interesting. Right. Absolutely. So Valentin says uh, the pebble is was ten million dollars. Yeah. So an example of the uh, sort of what you have to do to scale. I know Chris Walker did the Agent Watch. Uh, mm-hmm. I I helped fund that. I think you also backed that, right? Yep, absolutely. And one thing he specifically did is he limited per month uh, the number of units that were available. So there was like a January reward, a February reward, etc. Right. And that made it less likely that he was going to hit like a $10 million level, but at the same time, it helps scale, right? So if right. somebody was thinking of coming up with a, um, you know, some sort of, of hardware project, especially themselves, where there is some manufacturing involved, they would go. They would set it up, and it would be really smart for them to figure out what their capacity is, and mm-hmm. to limit the rewards in such a way that they're not going to overextend themselves or overpromise themselves and get into you know trouble. Because it's better than better to make a million dollars with a lot of positive PR than to make Absolutely. twenty million dollars with everybody hating your guts. Well, and and to be clear, you know, one of the things that you know from the standpoint of somebody who's creating a project, uh, being fully funded on on Kickstarter doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually making any money. You may just be covering right. the expenses to get the first round of something manufactured. I mean, particularly if you're doing something where you've got to bring some actual manufacturing capacity online, um, the expense involved with that could pretty much eat up anything that would be remotely related to profit and just get you to the point where, okay, I've got things rolling. Now I can start selling the items that will actually make me money. And the, the hard part is 
as a as Kickstarter backer, people have the expectation that whatever reward they're going to get is going to be given to them at a funding level, which is lower than if they went and purchased the product retail after the, the people go live. So it right. is really hard to get both ramped up and have any sort of buffer to allow you to, to get to that next step. It, it's really a hard balance. Yeah. And, the, and one of the things to be, you know, that people need to be really clear about as they approach, whether it's Kickstarter or Indiegogo or, um, one of the other ones is uh, Dragon Innovation is a newer one, I think. Um, you know, when you look at any of these uh, crowdfunding efforts, you have to keep in mind that there aren't any guarantees. Period. Yeah. You know that what you're doing is you're taking a risk on somebody's vision. That vision, you know, the, a project could get funded and that vision could come crashing down in flames. I mean, that certainly yeah. happens. And there are lots of projects that, you know, that look really worthy and don't get funded. Um, and I actually think that's know, okay for a project yeah. to fail if you fund it, as long as they explain to you. So let, so let me uh, convey one of my negative experiences on Kickstarter. So okay. a year and a half ago or so, I helped fund uh, a movie project. It was clearly some students, right? So they were trying to do a Star Wars movie. They had a bunch of 3D models set up. They had a bunch of footage and everything that, that went along with that. Um, and they had some initial positive stuff where they were explaining uh, you know, what they were doing. They meant you know, that they were going to miss their deadline, but they were, here's the progress that they were making and whatnot. The problem that they ran into, my guess, is the school year ended... And mm -hmm. when you're a student, the school year ends and you think that's the end of the world and you just you move on to other things and they never updated anything and they never delivered. Right. So right. I'm OK with the fact that they failed. It, it was really a small investment on my part. What I'm not OK with is the fact that they just kind of wussed out and didn't tell anybody that, hey, sorry, this didn't work. And they just sort of abandoned it. They took down their Facebook pages associated with it, et cetera. That's not cool. Right. Because that's that yeah. smells like a scam, right? Yeah, yeah, and that, and you know the so I, I think the yeah the ultimate uh, statement that we can make in terms of people who've never participated in backing projects is you know buyer beware. The whole caveat yeah. emptor, you know, go yeah. in with open eyes that this is not necessarily something where um, you know every everything's going to be hunky dory. But you look at what they're offering, you look at, you know, one of the things that I think uh, Kickstarter added recently as a requirement for projects is talking about the risks that are yeah. associated with a project and, and giving people an understanding that of what could possibly cause this project to fail. Yeah. Um, so should we, uh, should we talk about some of the things that we've backed that we have already gotten? Uh, so I have a, a, a couple of things open. Uh, okay. That you and I had discussed. Um, okay. Actually, yeah. If you just want to show off some stuff, uh, that's true. Sure. So you have a bunch of stuff handy, right? So I have. I, a bunch I have. Of stuff handy. I have some. So so I have. Uh, I have one thing handy that I'll show, and then you can uh, maybe you can show the other thing. So what I've got here is this was the first thing I ever backed. This is called Makey Makey, and it's a printed circuit board that uh, you connect via USB, mini USB, and it's essentially it acts as and I just pulled my headphones out because I'm clumsy. Um, <laughs> it acts, it acts as a USB input device, essentially as a keyboard. Um, but the the cool thing about this is it has at the bottom here is, are a series of connections that you can connect ground wires to. So in this case, I've got uh, it includes a bunch of alligator clips, so I can yep. clip this. Um, in this case, I'm going to ground to myself, and I discovered that the alligator clips really hurt if you attach them to your skin. So don't do that. Um, yes. Instead, Grounding I'm going to actually. Is a really good thing to do I'm in a going, lightning storm too, by the way. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm ground. Well, I'm grounding by USB. So I'm grounding myself with uh, my wedding band. Probably even less wise, but it conducts electricity well, so that's a good thing. So what you then do is you plug the other end of the USB into your PC, which I'm going to do, and then I'm <laughs> right, and then I'm actually going to. Uh, I'll go ahead and unplug my headphones and turn my speakers up so that hopefully you can actually hear what's going on. And I have uh, the Makey Makey page up. Let's see here. Uh, 
they actually have a little uh, flash-based drum kit that you can uh, play with your Makey Makey. And so I have one of these connected to the space key and one connected to the down arrow. And let me know if you can actually hear. Oops. And it just used the down arrow on my browser. And I browsed way down there. So let's try clicking into the... the there we go. Yep. Can you hear that? So I've got the bass and the... Uh, so I have... Here, let me... So I've now, so I now have a human drum kit. Now, this is a, just a really simple example, but one of the cool things that you can do is uh, they, they show examples where you could take, for example, I mean, you can basically anything that's conductive, you can now turn into a keyboard or a controller. So you could take, for example, a sheet of paper, draw on it with a graphite pencil, and then clip the alligator clips to the edge of the graphite and play that like a piano. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to plug my headphones back in so that we don't get any weird echoes. So, so, so I've also seen uh, examples of this where people were using it um, with fruit. Yes. Uh, you know, there's the old sort of potato battery and stuff idea, but people were making like banana pianos and all sorts of other strange things. Yeah, apparently they, they've gotten it working with uh, cupcakes, uh, bananas, basically anything that's got enough moisture to conduct electricity reasonably well. Um, Play-Doh. a really messy drum. <laughs> yeah. The, the cupcake drum kit. That would be, yes. that'd be pretty fun to watch. Um, but like so, that. and the Makey Makey was really, I mean, it was a very inexpensive thing to back. It's a very simple product. Um, but as you and I have joked about, you, you backed it as well. And uh, both of us ended up receiving it and then just kind of tucking the box in a corner and not playing with yes. it at all over here somewhere <laughs> <laughs> so the other yeah the other potential danger is you, you think that something sounds like a great idea and great fun but then when you once you funded it and you get your 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 uh your backers reward you know do, is it going to gather dust on a shelf and that's something that you know i don't mind i mean for something like makey makey it was just such yep. an awesomely fun idea and so simple that you know even though well, it sat on a shelf for a while projects you believe in uh, without right. the idea that you're necessarily going to get a reward. The idea is you believe in the project, you give them some money, you get something at the end, and hopefully just you know being conservation-minded that you don't just throw it away or throw it somewhere, but it's that's sort of a bonus. Right. Yeah. So Makey Makey was my first uh, Kickstarter project, and you know very happy with the, the end result. Cool. What about you? What was your first? Uh, what was your f first Kickstarter? Oh, I don't know what my first one was. Oh, yes, I do. It was it, it a project that failed. It didn't meet its funding goals, so I, you know I didn't have to give anything in the end. But it was right. um, it was called like the Axon um, .NET Micro Framework Board. Like somebody yes. was trying to come up with a really cool NetMF board. Um, open hardware, uh, open source, four hundred megahertz, sixteen megabytes of RAM, sixteen megabytes flash, ARM development board. Designed yep. to run the .NET micro framework. Yep. And unfortunately, he didn't meet his funding level and then didn't end up doing anything with it. But that was one of the first ones I backed. I also ha tend to back a lot of um, sort of geek art type stuff. So I have a few things here, which is really funny. I don't, I don't uh, play cards, but I uh -huh. do tend to back projects that, uh, you know, that do uh, like custom decks. So here's like the steampunk deck right uh -huh. um and here you can see it too it's pretty cool um oh, did, so that there. one actually succeeded yeah that one succeeded Very right cool. i have i don't remember if my space invader cards came from kickstarter or not but i've got these uh and then i did some really cool things like this is the cthulhu mug right some people see that so this is a clay mug that somebody was going and having put together and it's uh you know, they had a master model that they, they, they made, and then they went and had the, the clay manufactured, which this is a true manufacturing project when you think about it. It's right. not electronics. It's somebody had to go through and learn how to have ceramics mastered at, at a, you know, or produced, excuse me, on a pretty big scale. You know, yeah. what's funny is I had this sitting in the background of um, a, a, a video when I was calling campus one day, and everybody looked at that, and I think it was... Um, I think it was Brian Keller. He said, like, I think we know why you're so mellow. 
because he saw this and it looked like a bong from the video. <laughs> <laughs> He's right? like, so now we know you're so mellow. So, and then another one before we switch back over to you here uh-huh. is um, there's a a Blu-ray. Oh, there, is, there we go. Called I Dream of Wires. Uh-huh. And this was a project that was crowdfunded. It's a um, a uh, a Blu-ray disc, four-hour documentary on modular synthesizers and the beginning of analog synthesis and stuff. Oh wow! And it's it's really really well done. But they originally did it on Indiegogo um, to try to get funding to to create this and to have the limited editions. And now they're offering them for sale again. But uh-huh. you know, this is a real you know it's it's this one shrink wrapped. I had I got two when I when I pledged on it. Um, this one's shrink wrapped. But it's it's just it's it's a real product and it's you know a real Blu-ray and it's it's just really well done. And again, this is another example of a person had an idea for a documentary, and sure anybody can go on a video camera and film this, but he needed funding for sort of like higher quality video production, and then also just mastering and and you know putting in a package and producing a Blu-ray, right? So that was pretty cool as well. Right. So what else do you have Very here, cool. Andrew? Oh, so, uh, you know, I'm looking at your history page, and I think yours is, wow, yeah, so, yeah. so you've, you've backed 52 projects, so I think we might have to stage an intervention, Pete, because um, yeah. that's, 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 a, that's, a uh, that's a little little over the top. Um, my, my history page is I've backed six, so, <laughs> and so, just, speaking and of, this is one we can come back to it in a little bit, but I do want to give folks a heads up that one of the projects that you and I have both backed is called the RGB123 LED Matrices, which is a really cool multicolor LED project because we all can't, because we never have enough blinky lights. There's 74 minutes to go till that one uh, reaches its, its, uh, the end, the end of its funding period. Now it has already reached its goal and then some but if you want to actually get in and help support this it's a very cool project um it's actually so somebody me, who's let local me switch over to that okay like, give me one Sorry. second because i noticed it was duplicating the audio there so there'll be an echo just for a second just for a second um, for a second that's that's presenter all right now there should be no echo okay go ahead okay so uh the uh the the person leading up this project ryan o'hara is actually uh in our general local area. He's actually he's actually down uh, close to one of our uh, viewers down in Hampton, Virginia. Um, so uh, definitely a local hero. It looks like he's got a great plan. I love what he's doing with the with the project and can't wait. I, I uh, backed at the 8x8 eight eight, uh, matrix level, so 64 RGB LEDs. Um, can't, cannot wait to get that hooked up and, and playing around with it. Um, so speaking of intervention, I backed at the 8 by 8 by 8 which is this one that I'm showing on the screen here right now, which shows like the really wide one. Uh-huh. I'm going to have that, um, when I move my office to the other side of the wall, I keep talking about this fictional thing like it's actually going to happen at some point. <laughs> uh, when I move over there, that's going above my modular synth, and I'm going to like wire it up so that the audio from that is affecting the lights and everything, and it's going to be the best thing since, like, you know, the 60s and all of their cool chemical products that everybody that sounds, was into at the time. Yeah, that sounds entirely too trippy. <laughs> I think eight be fun. by eight by eight by eight. Wow. So is that all yeah, one PCB cool. or is that or you get you know, it's, eight uh, eight by eights? He does four eight by sixteens. Okay, that's very cool. Wow. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really excited for this one because I you know. I, I love blinky lights. It's loads. It's it's just a fun project. Um, so that's 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 one of the ones that uh, that I've backed that will uh, no doubt go forward given the the funding. But uh, hopefully a, f- a few more people can jump in if they want. Yeah. So, so, but speaking of you know in terms of history, the other one that I backed, we talked about this one a little bit last week. Is this Esprino, Espruino, the the yeah, microcontroller that runs that JavaScript? Um, and the reason I bring that one up is that, uh, turns out that, that Ryan, that Ryan, that Ryan, there we go. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. Turns out that Ryan, who's, who's doing the RGB, uh, matrices actually sent one of his, uh, pre-production model, or I guess one of his prototype models over to the folks who are doing the Esprino project, who then integrated that with their board, 
Um, so once I once I get both of those rewards, I'll be able to actually immediately put those two things together and have JavaScript control blinky lights, which makes me a very happy camper. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm not a big JavaScript fan, as you know, right? But I like anything microcontroller. And this board looks really well thought out. I, I think you and I had this discussion a little bit. Like, I think it would be more useful for that audience if they took more of a gadgeteer approach where it didn't require specific pinouts and stuff. But Arduino and similar have shown that that's usually not an obstacle for folks. So, um, you know, if right. you're interested enough, you'll get into it. Exactly. Very cool. Did you now, there see, was a by the way, project? You, yes. you said there was a similar project. Yes, there is a similar project. So, um, uh, let's see. I have Tesla here. You do have Tesla. Okay, yeah. yeah. So pull, pull that up because that's because yep. that project actually uh, is very similar to the Esprino in terms of being a microcontroller controlled by JavaScript, but they actually do take a approach that's not it's not gadgeteer. You know, it's not actual gadget here, but it's a very similar modular approach. In that, what they uh, provide is a board with four, uh, basically, I guess you'd call them sockets. Um, they're not the same style of sockets, or I guess you call them headers. But then the uh, actual modules that they're right, creating right. have just matching pins, and so they've got what they call class A and class B modules. So class A would include like a servo uh, controller. Um, or things like that. And you can just simply plug those in. And then what they're doing, which is really clever, is you can use NPM, the Node Package Manager, because what they're doing is leveraging uh, Node.js. You can use the Node Package Manager to load the packages that are essentially the driver for that piece, for that additional piece of hardware, that module. Um, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and 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 the and the neat thing about it is that what they're doing is they're actually pr they're printing they're silk screening on the PCB for the module the address or the name of the 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 package for the driver. So when you get the oh, piece of hardware okay. for the module, it already has npm such and such. So you don't have to remember how to load the module. You just type that in in their interactive uh you know, c command environment, and away you go. And I, I mean, I'm not going to be the guy who who says there's something better than Gadgeteer because I think yeah. Gadgeteer rocks for that kind of beginner stuff, and you don't even have to think about it because when you install all the gadget Gadgeteer stuff, the drivers are just there. But from the perspective of you know, kind of lower level hardware, this particular model makes it you know really easy to just kind of be plug and play and use a language that lots and lots of people already know. I see it, a lot of people don't want to code in C sharp or visual basic. It's just not their thing. So being right. able to do this in JavaScript is a, you know, a really big deal for them. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think having lots of options is a very, very happy thing when it comes to, you know, whether it's microcontrollers, whether it's, you know, different kinds of programming environments. Um, you know, I think choice can be a good thing. Yeah. That's a pretty cool thing. So you mentioned gadget here, and I've got here uh, my my gamo. Ah, uh, right. yes. So remember, this is one of the ones that. Um, let me switch back over to this. Okay, you've got one too. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do the pink one first. This is created by GHI and Electronics, right? They and did this that one's as a Kickstarter project. Go ahead. Yes, and that's for your daughter, right? Maybe. Um, so <laughs> You know, it's, I have I bought two. Like they had a, I should say, I backed with a reward for two. Yeah, so uh -huh. I've got the same thing. Um, yours is actually running something, which means you've done more with it than I have. Well, actually, so no. This is, the, this is the this is the preloaded uh, Pong demo. So I'm trying to play this. Actually, looking at my camera, so <laughs> it's really hard to do this with. Uh, so I'm, I'm stinking at this. I'm stinking at this very badly because I, I got a nasty reflection in there. So. There we go. Okay, I got two points, um, and you could just uh, anyway. So when uh, when you get this, it should have preloaded a little Pong demo, um, but basically it's just it's a .NET Micro Framework compatible uh, game console, right? So it's just a little miniature game console, um, and you can plug it in via USB. Um, it's got a little. It actually has a little proprietary cord, which I thought was interesting. Um, but what's neat about this is 
So it's programmable via uh, .NET Micro Framework, but it's also uh, it also has gadgeteer sockets inside. Um, so if I open up this case, there are several gadgeteer sockets that I could add additional sensors or uh, you know I could I could add an accelerometer module, right? Or if I wanted to do uh, more than just sort of uh, chip tune style music with a piezo, I could add something like a you know, an audio module that would allow me to right. potentially play back audio files. Um, so the the expandability of it and just the ability to kind of uh, learn a little bit about programming in you know microcontroller land, but in in a more kind of finished package than your typical. You know, I mean, your typical microcontroller board is. Um, you know, not not exactly uh, pretty to look at unless you're a fan of PCBs. <laughs> right. so. so this is pretty cool. Uh, I have up on the screen here right now the um, GHI Electronics site where they have the GAMO listed. So it mm-hmm. doesn't look like it's for sale just yet. Um, right. But, you know, all of us who backed it through Kickstarter, we've gotten our rewards. We got, you know, our versions of it. But this is something that they use to, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, use Kickstarter to gauge interest and also kind of bootstrap the the funding because, you know, they have to do things like pay for, um, you know, tooling for a plastic shell and all that kind of stuff, which yep. you wouldn't necessarily want to do, even if you're a big company like GHI, unless you had a minimum number of, of orders ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's a good point that Kickstarter doesn't necessarily have to be just like a one-man shop trying to, you know, bring some brand new idea to fruition. Kickstarter can, or other, you know, some of the other crowdfunding can also be a way of, um, as you say, gauging interest. It's like, okay, I love this idea. I think this will sell, but if I'm wrong and I make 10,000 of these, yeah, I could take a bath really easily. Right. Whereas if I say, okay, here's my very, you know, here's my relatively modest goal. And one of the things that, that I'll give uh, GHI some real credit for is they've been very you know they've been very modest in their goals in terms of their kickstarters they're they're really I think just trying to as you say just kind of jump start the process um, in a way that can help get information you know get both gauge interest and also inform the community that hey here's this cool thing that we're doing that uh, that you may want to you may want to get into okay and so um you informed me about something else that GHI has been up to. Um, yes. Also, it's a new Kickstarter project. So let's let's go there. Okay. So the so the new project that they actually just launched today is something called Fez Medusa. Um, and Fez, for those who are uh, uninitiated, it st- used to stand for something else, but uh, today stands for f- uh, fun and e- or fast and easy. No, fun and easy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fun and easy. Um, so Always Fez. think about the future when you name something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there have been some conversations about that. Um, but so the idea behind Fun and Easy is a lot of the products that GHI makes, um, particularly for sort of the broader developer and hobbyist community, um, are designed to be really easy to use. So they're a big backer of Gadgeteer, you know, which had the whole idea of let's make it easy to plug and play different components pull them apart and do a different project, pull them apart and do another project, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so in keeping with the, the kind of fun and easy theme, but really trying to bring the, the prices as low as possible to kind of make this kind of modularized programming available to as wide an audience as possible, the Fez Medusa mm-hmm. project is actually taking what's been really uh, successful for GHI with the .NET Micro Framework and bringing that to an Arduino style programming. So taking some of the same processors that are in Arduino boards and building out stuff like, for example, the, uh, the Fez Medusa Mini is a tiny little board. I mean, it's, it's probably uh, maybe an inch and a half by three quarters of an inch. Um, and it has four gadgeteer sockets. Yep. And one of those you use to connect to your computer and program via serial interface. And then three of them are available for different types of modules to plug in. Right. So I and, have it up here right now. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and I increased my volume uh, thanks uh, UCA Elegance. Uh, hopefully that sounds a little bit better. Um, but I have up here, it says the Fez Medusa Mini, 
the Fez Medusa S12, and then the Fez Medusa Shield. So it seems like they're really I, kind of gone whole hog on trying to make this as easy as possible to to interface the Arduino world with the Gadgeteer modules. Exactly, and the, and so what the you know so the goal there is to is to really take this uh, existing. Uh, slate of hardware or you know, all these available modules and there's a ton of different modules available from something simple like a button module or a potentiometer to all manner of sensors they've got sensors that you can connect to your car's computer um, you know there yeah. there there's a subset of the modules Here's that my, are actually my MIDI one you, uh, yeah so Pete's it. got a MIDI one and actually if you scroll down a little bit more you'll see uh, both Valentin's Chucky module is listed on the page, as well as my oh, infrared as well as your, under, your LED. under the yeah under the com, com, uh, community modules. Um, so the the advantage of having this kind of modular environment is it's really it's all just one uh, standardized cable, same pinouts. Um, you don't have to figure out where things plug in. You simply look at the the. Uh, the letters that are on the socket, and they indicate what kind of bus or connection. So A right. for analog, you know, um, I for I2C or I squared C, um, S for for SPI, and then you connect them the right way. And then inside the Arduino environment, you can uh, write the code. And there's lots of code examples for the different modules that are available. Yep. You write the code that uses uh, the the libraries that they've created in, you know, I guess in C or C plus um, plus to actually drive those modules. So, so what's interesting here to me is, uh, you know, .NET Micro Framework and and Gadgeteer stuff are open source offerings from Microsoft, um, right? Because they're fully open source, and they, and sorry, there's some distortion there. Uh, because they're fully open source, and because there's some standards behind that, you can take this and implement on anything that you want. And it was it's really interesting to me to see a company like GHI go through all the effort of taking something that's a, from a very uh, event-driven, multi-threaded language and to port all those drivers uh, over to something that could be used by Arduino. It's, it's brilliant right. on their part because the Arduino community is quite a bit larger than, than uh, any other one. Well, and I think the other thing that's a that's a, a big advantage is that by providing a bridge between Arduino and Gadgeteer, um, if you were building a project out and you were using, say, the the Fez Medusa Mini, and you found that okay, there's just no way that I can implement what I want to do inside the the limitations of the memory space of this board, you could still take all of those modules and bring those over to the .NET Micro Framework environment with one of their uh, one of get one of the Gadgeteer main boards that that GHI makes which yeah. have substantially faster processors much more memory um, you know they're just overall a lot more powerful boards but you know the 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 downside to the more power is they're more expensive and so you've got at that point the ni- a, a really nice balance between you know a really affordable kind of entry level and really you know kind of well-supported way to use these modules and the ability to grow through to, okay, I need to actually go to something that's, you know, more powerful and has more RAM, has more, you know, yep. program space. Um, it gives them a whole wide range of offerings, which I think is really helpful. The other thing I like is, you know, besides the fact that, um, you know, you can get these, uh, uh, you know, the, the process used on the Arduino here, the Atmel chips, you can get them for like under a dollar, well under a dollar, whereas right. the ARM chips are usually around 10 bucks or so for those uh, more powerful ones. Mm-hmm. The, the thing I really like about this is it's, it's really good continuity, like you said, um, but also mm-hmm. the Arduino fills some gaps that you can't do with the .NET Micro Framework. So, for example, real-time signal processing and audio generation, those are right. things that you can do on Arduino that you can't really do on a .NET Micro Framework. So this a, a really good way to reuse your investment there. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to back this. Not right yeah. here on camera, but I'm going to back this. <laughs> hey, so, uh, I, you know, I mentioned music. Before we get into a couple other tech things, since we're sort of heading in towards the end of the show here, is I want right. to show a completely different kind of, of backing project. Okay. Um, so this one is uh, Jordan Rudis's Pledge uh, Music campaign. Uh-huh. Music, not music. Not, not sure what no. music is. What is music? Uh, 
I'm not sure what music is. So, um, you know, I've kept a, a, a relationship going with Jordan since, uh, since build and stuff. And so I, I get to find out about some of these things. Um, but I'm also a fan. I, I, you know, I like his music, like everything there. So this is a site called Pledge Music. And it enables artists uh, who are not all rich and, and, and just have all this uh, extensive like money being thrown at them like everybody seems to think. It uh-huh. makes it possible for them to back larger projects that are independent of you know, music labels and, and everybody else who's kind of grubbing for money. Right. So, for example, this one uh, involves an orchestra. And involves Jordan's playing and involves uh, an iPad app and uh, like an interactive experience and whatnot. And all mm-hmm. of those things have significant funding requirements. Like think about renting an orchestra, right? Renting an orchestra cannot be cheap. Right? So yeah, uh, so he's you, doing that you for just this. Get a big plate of bagels and yeah, know. and everybody's good, right? It's Musicians like it's like geeks. You just throw enough throw enough t-shirts <laughs> at him and everybody will come, right? Exactly. Um, so he's doing this, and I backed this particular project here. It's um, I'm not logged in on it, so it doesn't show that. Um, but I was interested in this to be able to get the resulting album. And what right. he's been doing for updates here is he has updates that are exclusive to the people who are backing the project, where he's playing little bits of the music, giving uh, you know status updates all throughout, etc. And you see mm-hmm. that this one has had 777 pledges, which is uh, it's definitely a lucky number. And their funding model is a little bit different, where you can pledge all the way up until the release. Like there's right. some there's some cutoff where once it, it it has to meet funding within a certain amount of time. Right. But once it does, it's still open for everybody to pledge after that. So it's a, it's like a slightly different model. Right. So that's a very, very, very cool, cool idea. Yeah. Now there's there's another one here I wanted to point out, which is um, for teaching kids to to program. Mm-hmm. Did you check that one out? You know, so I haven't had a chance to product. look at that one, so you should show me. Okay. So this is uh, the Robot Turtles game. And you can see it's reached roughly 10 times its funding. It's uh, 225000 versus its 25000 goal. I hope they've considered that when they were looking at what it takes for manufacturing. <laughs> but this is a board game for teaching uh-huh. kids logic and how to program. And so I back this because I'm always trying to think of interesting ways to teach my kids this type of stuff where right. I, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that whether or not they go into programming or something as an industry in the future, you know, programming and these type of skills are just one of those essential skills that kids are going to need. Right. Right. It's, you know, like learning how to type was when we were younger. You know, the people who didn't learn how to type are, are definitely hurting these days. Right. So this one, uh, it's it came sort of organically out of some uh, some work that this person did with their child where. Right. They was just trying to find something uh, educational, and then it sort of morphed into a board game. It's something I have no idea if my kids are going to like it. Um, they're all ADD like me, so they might like it for half an hour and then <laughs> never open it again. Um, but at the same time, I love this concept, and I would definitely back anything that, that seeks to promote this type of stuff with kids. Yeah, that looks very cool. It reminds yeah, me. I mean, still- yeah. Ob- obviously, there's lots of environments that have that have used the turtle as a metaphor, but it reminds me of you know the small basic uh, environment, which uh, is one of the ways that I've I've been working with my kids to learn uh, how to program. Yeah, like my daughter can't stand sitting in front of a screen, and it's like, okay, well, do I really want to encourage you to sit in front of a screen? Like, is that sort of the goal? <laughs> here? Yeah. Right? So um, she just doesn't have patience for that kind of stuff. I actually can't take her to the movies. My son, on the other hand, would sit through a marathon of like Lord of the Wing, Rings and be fine. Um, but for some, for her, this is the way. And then also the the things like, um, oh, what's that other the electronics project that I I got before the uh, little bits. Those things oh, are yeah. going to be the ways that I can help get these skills, uh, you know, into her brain. Yeah, and that's and that's I mean that's an interesting point because I'm going a little bit beyond the the, the Kickstarter theme. Um, you know, I've tried a, a number of different ways to kind of teach some of the concepts around electronics to my kids, and you know, I get, probably can't see it on camera, but, but uh, back on my um, back on my workbench, I've got a couple of kind of I forget the name of the project, but um, it's just basically a a starter electronics kit in a box. And so I had yep. one for me and one for my my oldest son, who's ten, 
and you know it comes with a little you know a breadboard and you know all of the various electronic components that you might want to test with right LEDs and uh, resistors and all of that good stuff um, and we've used it a couple of times but it's one of those things where because there's lots of little fiddly bits um, it's easy to kind of find yeah. it tedious to work with um, yep. so one of the things that I that I I actually just decided to shell out the bucks for the kind of the teachers kit. I bought the teacher's kit of snap circuits. So it's this vacuum molded plastic suitcase full of, I think there are three layers of snap circuits components. And for folks who haven't seen snap circuits, it's basically electronics that snap together using the kind of snaps that you have on your clothing. And so each electronic component, whether that be a switch or a light or a fan or whatever else, is mounted onto like a Lexan uh, base, which has a snap at either end, and it's got a receiving snap on the bottom and a, and kind of the kind of the female on the bottom, the male on the top, so you can snap them together every which way. And the teacher kit has, I think, five different books of projects. There's probably something like seven hundred projects in the teacher's wow. kit. Yeah, and so there was actually last year I went to uh, the Richmond Code Camp, um, and I was speaking. And I decided to take Joseph with me, my, my uh, oldest, and took the snap circuits. And then when I had to go and speak, I said, you know, you can hang out in the speaker room with the snap circuits and, you know, kept him very occupied. Although it turned out um, he, he ended up actually helping another speaker with her talk. Uh, her laptop had died and she needed to demonstrate uh, message bus stuff. So she... Mm -hmm. She had him be the message bus. She gave him a bunch of little pieces of, of crumpled up paper and had her, and and had her had him throw her throw them at her as the message <laughs> bus. <laughs> the, the closest I ever came to that is I was the remote for the TV when I was little. <laughs> yes. Go change a channel. Hey, uh, there's so, yeah. one other project that I uh, I would like to cover in the last couple of minutes here, and this okay. is something else that you brought up to me, and it looks like it's an extremely successful Kickstarter project. And that's the uh, emotive insight. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Very so cool. So I'm I like anything that that kind of limits the number of things between your brain and what you're trying to accomplish. So why don't you talk about this a little bit? Well, so the, the so the basics. I, I first heard about uh, the uh, emotive headsets on uh, .NET Rocks. Actually, um, Carl and Richard were talking about it because well, they like geek stuff too. Um, but so. The original emotive headset was a, it's basically a brainwave reader, um, essentially. So, um, but the original headset, you know, you kind of had to put it on and you had to, I think you had to put some kind of goop on the electrodes to get it to get good signal. Um, you know, there were some limitations to it. Goop that people is did. always a limiting factor in adoption. Yeah, exactly. If you have I to mean, smear I your head with KY, it's probably not going to happen. Okay. Don't think you needed to go there, but that's okay. So... Yeah, it, what this what this Kickstarter is the emotive insight is sort of their I don't know if it's their V two but it's it's the next generation of the headset and it's designed to work without any kind of um, goop <laughs> you know um, and, but the hey, but the I, basic you're the one with the mining helmet last time so I'll be goop <laughs> this time but the basic idea behind this is you put it on your head and it reads different different uh, wavelengths or, or, or um, you know, it reads your brain waves and you can use that to control software in a wide variety of ways. Um, and so the idea of mind controlling your computer in some way becomes very appealing. And, and if you think about it, in terms of this whole sort of internet of things, Imagine if you had your emotive headset headset on and you were kind of wirelessly connected to your PC up in your office, which is running a bunch of you know a bunch of communications to microcontrollers around the house. You could just sit in your easy chair and control everything without yeah. ever getting up. It's totally Wally. I don't know right. if that's a dream or a nightmare, but <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking through the backers here and I noticed that um, the first eight hundred thousand came from somebody named NSA. Right, so I think they might be interested in this. Is that what's going on? <laughs> all right, I'm but. thinking that was that was that was it was a bad, bad, bad joke. Terrible. Yeah, all right, I was trying. No, this yeah. is cool. So, uh, the so first time so I heard about these guys, so the first time I heard about these guys, uh, Rick Barraza had done a demo with an old version of their headset back right. uh, 
at one of the mix show off events. So it was the mm-hmm. same one that I did the C64 emulator just before I joined Microsoft. He did freaking Jedi mind control on a screen, but he got downvoted constantly because nobody believed it was real. They didn't think he really was just thinking and then finally able to make something move on the screen. So everybody right. thought it was just smoke and mirrors, but it turns out it was actually quite real. Well, and, and in the case of the first generation headset, probably quite a lot of practice because yes. one of the things, you know, and, and there's actually, there's a, a relatively inexpensive, or at least compared to the headset, um, toy that actually is kind of, I, it, I think it's actually Jedi themed that you you control. Yeah, the um, ball, right? Has, yeah, it has a little blower and it, yeah, and, and, and a little headset. But but the trick is that you have to you you know it's looking for a particular type of, of waveform or wavelength in that case, and you have to figure out you know with concentration or or you know th- thinking different ways, you know once you hit on it if you practice often enough you could replicate that. I think one of the things that they're doing with the with the insight is trying to make it l- require less effort on the part of the user and build more of the intelligence into the software and the hardware and the sensors. So I'm looking But they've here, gotten uh, So uh, they've just gotten just iPhone 1.3 million 1.3 yeah. million dollars. That's ridiculously <laughs> it's like wow. So um, it's like yeah, 200 bucks. Uh-huh. 200 Is there an API well, or something? So there so yeah, so when I was looking at that earlier um, let me go back to the home page for the project. Um, the the different backing level it, it looks like so you can get the headset which would be more like from a consumer yeah like you're you're a user of it um yep. for i think the it looks like uh oh they have uh, the, 400 the minimum, for the, the minimum would be yeah the minimum would be $229 to actually get the headset oh excuse me a little sneeze there uh so but the in order to actually get the developer edition with the SDK access, uh, it looks like the the lowest pre- pledge level is three twenty nine, um, and so that includes SDK for Android, iOS, OS ten, Linux, and Windows. Um, okay, cool. So, you know, that's certainly something I you know wasn't really wasn't sure I was ready to pr- to to pledge quite that much um right. but there's there's three days three days left so i might still jump in on this one it looks pretty cool I mean, the thing itself looks like a face hugger or something from aliens it's, it, there's, it does there's really have no that, way to have uh, something like this yeah in in that whole in that whole realm of you know looking looking really geeky lest we lest we forget my super duper geeky glasses um and actually, if I put th- if I put these glasses on and then put the emotive headset on, that could look really cool. I think that could look very yeah. cyberpunk. That seems like a really good way to end this show. <laughs> so I think I, um, I'd be looking all Johnny Johnny mnemonic. Yeah, I, Hit me. so everybody's blind. Oh, let's see. Valentin asks, "I wonder how good it is compared to NeuroSky's MindWave." I got to tell you, I didn't realize there was more than one way to control stuff with your brain. So I I haven't checked that. <laughs> um, so very interesting. Um, here, here's a here's a hint for folks: don't control anything deadly with this. Like I saw somebody controlling a little helicopter there. I think it's just one of those little plastic jobs. That's so good. I wouldn't recommend sort of like controlling anything really kind of scary with this. Um, every time somebody makes robots with guns and stuff in a movie, it never turns out well. So please don't uh, do that there. But still, cool. Please device. don't create Skynet. Yes, okay? please don't. Right? Skynet would be bad. Okay. So I think we're going to do this again next week, right? Uh, yes. My mother's going to be down that week, but I think I'm still going to take the hour off. Uh, I might need the hour off uh, <laughs> in the afternoon that, that day to do this. So tentatively, we're looking at doing a, a show on, I think it's game technology. Yeah. yeah right? So. so we'll see how that, uh, that goes. It should be pretty exciting. So there's lots of cool kind of game technology stuff coming out. All right? Sounds and if good. anybody has any other questions... Uh, you know, feel free to post them directly on stream or, you know, tweet us on, uh, uh, on Twitter. Um, yeah, I, if you have I, suggestions I for the show, stuff you didn't like stuff that you did like, just let us know. This is only the second episode where, so we're trying to make it better for sure. And I suggested on Twitter, if you want to uh, make sure that we are aware of your tweets, just ha- uh, ta- tag them with the hashtag uninitialized show. Oh, good, good idea. I'll put and, that in the uh, artwork as well. 
Yeah, and we'll get that way. We'll uh, be able to keep track of those without uh, necessarily looking for our specific uh, Twitter IDs. Oh, but, and, uh, and uh, two open things. One, mm-hmm. um, thank you for the show music, Andrew. That was uh, what you did on FL Studio Groove. So that was very yeah. cool. And then the second one is somebody asked what my shirt was today. So this is a combination of uh, of Totoro and Bioshock. So oop, let me. Ah, there we go. Very nice. So that's uh, that's and, and in I case anybody's what the big guys called but in case any, uh, the, the you're, it's the big daddy you have the big daddy so mine is yeah. the uh, the IE shirt from I think it was uh, what the first build conference it's kind of the zeros and ones as the leaves it's oh, I see, kind yeah. of trees it's no! the forest of zeros and ones yeah it's kind of dorky but I hate these it was it yeah so and uh, one other thing yeah one other thing that's one other thing that's that's important for us to to mention. Uh, Pete and I both work for Microsoft, but this show is not a, an official Microsoft show. This is purely our opinion, our fun, geeky stuff. Um, you know, any resemblance to uh, real people or or real non geek people uh, is purely coincidental. <laughs> no, thank thank you for for bringing that up. So always a good idea. So cool, and enjoy your your gun, and I'm gonna enjoy my mine right here. <laughs> To just to make that awesome sound. Awesome. I love that. All right. Thanks. See you all next week.